Have you ever wondered what your life would be like after dance? Or have you asked yourself, when would be the right time to hang up your shoes? This is Season 2, Episode 5, Number 38, called Life After Dance, with Toronto legend Kojo Touch Maine. Stephen King once said, Remember, hope is a good thing, maybe the best of things, and no good thing ever dies. We hope everyone is staying healthy, safe, and creative during this period of isolation, and we want to continue to spread some light and love to everyone in our community. A quick reminder to check in on those you care about, or to those who may need some assistance and comfort during this time. Now, it's no secret that the COVID-19 pandemic has affected artists around the world, But if there's one thing we do know about artists, it's that we're very resourceful, resilient, and above all, supportive. Dancers around the world have been participating in online dance classes from their favorite instructors, joining in on all the fun on TikTok, and have been providing resources and support to one another. The Government of Canada also just recently announced an update by consolidating the Emergency Care Benefit and the Emergency Support Benefit into the Canada Emergency Relief Benefit, or CERB. Now, this taxable benefit provides Canadians with $2,000 a month for up to four months and applies to wage earners as well as contract workers and the self-employed. The portal for accessing the CERB is expected to be live on April 6th, and once you finish the application, you can expect the funds to be in your account within 10 business days. Now, if you haven't done so already, we highly recommend that you get an access code for the CRA website as soon as possible as you will need this to apply for the CERB. You can find more information about the CERB on the Government of Canada website at www.canada.ca. The Toronto Arts Foundation and the Toronto Arts Council are introducing the TO Artist COVID Response Fund. This fund will allocate up to $1,000 to the self-employed, individual artist residents in Toronto whose work has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. For more information about the fund and to apply, you can visit them at www.torontoartscouncil.org. Applications are now open and will be accepted until April 30th. Now, as a reminder, at the Dance Plug, we started a relief fund dedicated to the freelance dance artists residing in the Greater Toronto area who are also dealing with tremendous financial losses due to the COVID-19 pandemic. As an update, we just surpassed $3,500 in our fund and would like to thank everyone for the continued support, those who have continued to share our post, those who have donated, and also the companies and organizations who have decided to add to our cause. We have just finalized the eligibility requirements, and you can find those on our GoFundMe page. If you have any questions, feel free to email us at thedanceplugto at gmail.com. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome to another episode of Season 2 of the Unplugged Podcast presented by Dance Plug Canada. My name is Roy Bonozo, and I'm a former dance studio manager turned dance entrepreneur and advocate. Each week, we bring you a guest or guests who talk about their experiences working in the industry, along with some valuable insight and opinions about hot topics in our community. This week, we sat down with Toronto legend Kojo Touch Maine. Through Toronto's premier entertainment company, Doodad Entertainment, Touch has transformed his passion for dance into a thriving career. Touch has risen to the top of his craft after a sought-after dancer and performer and choreographer known for his performance abilities and professionalism. Touch joined Doodad Entertainment in 1998, and since then has performed for top musicians and entertainers such as Sean Desmond, Eve and Gwen Stefani, Julie Black, Missy Elliott, and Selena Gomez. He's worked with Sean Paul, Rihanna, Christina Aguilera, and Jay-Z in music videos and commercials, and in addition, Touch has appeared in numerous film and television stage productions such as the 2011 Much Music Awards, the Listener Series, the 2010 Olympic Torch Ceremony, the motion picture Honey featuring Jessica Alba, the Junos, and the BET Awards. A few highlights have been assisting Luther Brown on So You Think You Can Dance Canada, Lifetime's 2014 biopic Aaliyah, The Princess of R&B, and the 2015 Pan Am opening ceremony. Most recently, Touch choreographed for Chinese superstar Chris Wu's performance on the 2018 iHeartRadio MMVAs and the 2019 television series Tall Boys on CBC. With over 20 years of experience, Touch is a fixture of the Toronto dance industry, having taught classes and workshops internationally, guiding and working with some up-and-coming artists, and judging at the World of Dance competition in 2011-2012 and the 2017-2018 Canada Hip Hop Dance Championships. We are so excited for you to listen to this episode, so without further ado, this is Season 2, Episode 5, 
called Life After Dance with Kojo Touch Me. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 5, and it's my esteemed pleasure to welcome to the show Toronto legend Kojo Touch Maine. Touch, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. What's this self-isolation been like for you? This (laughs) self-isolation has been, to be honest, it hasn't been too hard for me in the sense that I always like to say I'm like an extroverted introvert at times. Um, Where I don't mind, I'm not a homebody by any means, but I don't mind being at home. I don't mind being with myself. Like some people need other people. So I found a lot of things to do. I always do my workouts, do my little quick shopping runs. I watch my Netflix. I think caught up with Netflix by now. (laughs) (laughs) It's a good time for me to just like concentrate on a lot of stuff I haven't been able to do. I've been so wound up. I've been so busy. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly on the road. I'm constantly moving. I'm constantly working. So this has been for me a great time to actually like Bring it down, focus on some things that I've wanted to focus on for a while, Uh, focus on family, focus on um, better connections with friends, and then again, just focus on a lot of work. That's great. Now, for those people who don't know, uh, Touch has been around the Toronto community for years. I'm not going to kind of like say the number. Years Um, Years and years. But for the current generation of dancers who may not know who you are, uh, can you give us a brief explanation about one, who you are and what your relationship yeah. to the Toronto dance community is. So again, as you know, like we've been saying, I'm Kojo, uh, Kojo man, affectionately known as Touch. I've been around. I'm grown. Uh, I guess I have like OG status now, which I actually enjoy. Really and truly, I started in this dance game in 1998. I started with my brothers, my sisters in a dance crew called Do That. Do That was Toronto's premier urban agency. We did a lot of live shows. It was one of the first urban dance groups that started working with artists. Uh, We did videos. We did award shows in Toronto. We did every and single performance type of show you could think of in Toronto uh, for years and years and years. Um, Obviously, under the helm of Luther Brown, my brother, my brother, Luther Brown, him and the rest of my brothers and sisters on Do That uh, we worked together to just make ish happen mm. around the city. Um, been dancing in Toronto for years and years, born and raised. From dancing, I went on to teaching. Uh, from teaching, I went into some choreography, to some acting here and there, um, and just kept the grind on. Now I still dance. Um, I still teach. Um, I do other things, though, which we'll get into. Um, but I'm just... A regular, a regular kid from Toronto who found his passion. Mm. And my passion was to dance. That's awesome. Yeah. Who would you say are some of your biggest inspirations growing up? Mm. You can't talk about inspiration without talking about Michael Jackson. I can't talk about inspiration without talking about Diddy, Usher. I'll say those three. There's more, obviously. Uh, but those three, specifically artists, uh, really pushed me uh to find my passion in dance like i remember being a kid just watching michael jackson i remember where i was when thriller Mm. uh came out i remember where i was when um black or white came out i remember where i was when he first did the moonwalk on national television he was just one of those artists who like i just dropped everything Mm. i saw him on tv and there was just something he just had that magic which made me just like drop what i was doing and just focusing on him. Then later on, it was like Puffy. And then Puffy just had that swag. He had that, that flay. I don't even want to say swag. I hate saying swag. He had that flay. He had that flay, uh, that performance factor, that, uh, that confidence, um, that really, really, um, I don't want to, how do I say this? It really, I don't want to say it took control, but it really kind of like transformed myself it really transformed how i danced um and how i the impression i want to make on people usher also had that same feel for me he was just so suave he was just so smooth with it um that again him as well both those artists were able to um leave an impression on me that i wanted to leave on other people if i talk about inspiration i have to talk about luther brown 
I was dancing, yes, before I joined Do That, uh, like school assemblies, uh, just dancing with friends, like nothing, nothing major. Mm -hmm. um, and then the story, a quick story is uh, my sister, she went to school with Luther Brown in Windsor. And then um, she would always be telling me about there's this guy in Windsor and he got the crew and da da da. And I told him you dance and you should try to dance. And I was like, I was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then she'd just be on me all the time. Like, there's this crew and you got to dance and da da da. And I said, you got to see my brother and da da da. I was like, okay, well, whatever. And then what happened was uh, they had auditions in Toronto at one point. And I was just looking for something else to join, something else to do. So my sister's like, they have an audition. You got to audition. I told Luther, you got to audition. So um, I was like, all right. Um, and that time you had, it was like a crazy audition. You had to like make up routines. Like I had to make up three different routines at three different tempos. And then I had to go audition them. Like it's not even learn choreography. I had to show him my choreo. And that was like, okay, that was an extra pressure. But I did that and obviously <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> um, but working with Luther has been eye-opening and it really has been profound in the sense that he was able to bring a lot of a lot out of me, mm -hmm. which I didn't even know. It's like one of those things where like you get the right the right dancer with the right choreographer, with the right artist. And just magic happens. And for me, that's what it was. So just working with Luther and just seeing how his mind worked and just being with him day and day after day after day. And obviously with my brothers and my sisters, my, my crew, they all brought me inspiration to be better, to keep going, to, to really cultivate a passion for dance, not for accolades. There's one, I have to say one other thing. Especially these days, when you're just doing your thing, when you're dancing, you're doing your thing, you're not necessarily thinking about who did it before you or what is your legacy or how are you making your community better. It's just like, I like to dance. I want to dance. People like to see me dance. Okay. But for me growing up, I did have male. I never did. I didn't go to dance studios growing up. I, I wasn't a dance studio kid. Um, Again, I just did assemblies and I had a few friends, not a big circle, but I had a few friends who liked to dance. Um, but other than that, I didn't really see dance as, hey, let's all go dance. Like it wasn't the thing. Like I had boys playing basketball or playing sports. I did, I did all that too. But they weren't like, okay, now let's go dance. Like I only had a few selective friends who wanted to dance. So I didn't necessarily see a lot of like guys, like real guys dancing. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was a matter of seeing, um, a few guys on TV, uh, who really inspired me to like, really, really push myself to dance and know that dance could be a career and who I'm talking about are like, if you don't know these guys, <laughs> these guys are still dancing. They're still, they're still doing the thing. Uh, they're still in the business, in the industry, but just to name a few of them, there was. Punch and Goof, there was Rich and Tone, uh, there was Swoop, Swoop, there was Ed Mo, I say Ed Mo, but Ed Moore, uh, even Eddie Morales. Um, these are a bunch of LA, New York dancers. Um, for me, what was so important about them was that they danced. These gentlemen dance like guys, they dance like dudes. And what I mean is they just had like a confidence. I don't even want to say a masculinity, but they were masculine dudes. Looked like dudes, danced like dudes. They had strength. They had presence. Like, I didn't see that a lot. Mm. So it really is something about seeing yourself, whether it be in, in social media, on TV, in whatever, in whatever industry you're, you're trying to, to be in. There really is an inspiration that comes when you can see yourself in someone else. And to make a long story short, I was just able to see myself in these men and know that, hey, it's like guys dance, guys look good dancing. And I also saw that I could make a career. If I really wanted to, if I really worked and I really had the passion, I knew it was possible to um, be a dancer and be a hip hop dancer.
Nice. Now, earlier on, you were talking about longevity, and you've been in this quote-unquote game since 1998. At least, professionally. What did the Toronto dance scene look like then, uh, when you were you know, growing up as an emerging artist? Again, I have to say, when I think about the dance scene um, back then, uh, there's obviously a bunch of similarities to now. However, I think the main thing was, it was just the opportunities were a lot more, a lot, uh, a lot more varied. Mm. There's a lot more opportunity I find than there is right now. Um, to be honest, when I first started, it was like every show there was every, I mean, every week there was shows like, uh, if I'm talking about do that, for instance, uh, every week we were either, um, opening up, opening up for an artist. Like back then we used to have, uh, dance crews. Like nowadays we don't have dance crews. I find there's a couple here and there, but it's not like we used to have, we used to have a bunch of dance crews, um, and dance crews would like open up shows for artists. Like for instance, we'd have Little Kim come in town, Drew Hill, um, and they would play clubs, and then we would be able to open up for them. Nice. That was always cool. Uh, we always had. There's a lot of artists. Like that was another thing I was talking about with someone the other day. Like we don't have as many artists as we used to. So there were so many artists from Cardinal to Julie Black to Baby Blue Sound Crew, uh, Sean Desmond. There were so many opportunities to dance for different artists around the city. Um, I find we don't have that anymore. What I remember uh, throughout the years is that there was a lot more uh, community, mm. I find. Like, I think it's because we were dancing. It was more about crews than individual dancers. Um, it was more about how can you help each other out. Um, I know, for instance, with, with Do That, it, it was a brotherhood. It was a sisterhood. It was a crew. Um, so all these shows we were doing, it, it was us. It wasn't like, okay, let me get you, 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 you together. And then next performance, let me get you three and then you two from somewhere else. And then at the next performance, let me get everyone from another part of the city together. No, it was like this crew, like do that was always dancing together. It really helped to, uh, to build us up and, and, and improve us and keep us on our toes and keep us working and keep us passionate. Um, and we looked out for each other. Mm. If there were different gigs around the city and we heard about it, hey, da da da, da do you hear about this? Da 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 da. Or, um, hey, we have a gig in the morning. Do you need somewhere to stay? Are you okay? Uh, do you need a way to get down there? It's just, uh, it was a lot more, um, I find, community mm. amongst the dancers or at least the dancers in your circle. Not to say that that's not there now, but it's, it's not as present. Mm. Um, and I, I feel you can feel that. As well, again, times change, so it's always different. But um, back then, especially performing, it was about leaving impressions and making people feel. I think a lot right now is like, it's, it's, it's a lot for me. And when I watch, when I go to Choreographer's Ball, and I go to sometimes Fever, or I'll go to different dance events. Um, it just, a lot of times it just feels very, if I'm being honest, it just feels very mechanical. Meaning you go up, you kill the choreography, you're very technical, you get off stage. Uh, two acts later, I see you again, you come on stage, very technical, you kill it, boom, 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 you're off stage. Three acts later, I see you again, you're very technical, da, 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 boom, boom, boom. Um, and then it's just a matter of like, okay. So all the groups are very technical, but at the end of the day, which ones did I remember? I don't remember anything I saw. It all looked great, maybe, but nothing left an impression on me. Nothing, I don't remember anything. No one stood out mm. because you've done 10 different numbers in the, in the show. You don't stand out to me. I saw you on the stage the whole night. Like, it's just stuff like that. Whereas back in the day, um, it was like, okay, you and your crew got together. You did one performance that you put all, you put your all in that one performance. You figured out how you could connect with the, with the audience. Um, and it was about leaving something with them. There's a lot of different dancers who I enjoy watching these days, but there's too many dancers that I don't really enjoy watching.
and I don't know if that sounds, I don't mean to sound a ways, but it's just the fact that a lot of dancers these days, it's like they lack performance. Um, so I, I feel like we're losing that and we don't get that. Um, yeah. Now I want to talk about Doodad for a bit. How much of an impact has uh, Doodad created for you specifically? Um, oh man. I mean, you've, you've danced for multiple artists, obviously, yeah. like. What yeah. else can you, what else can you say about that? Oh man, I think for me what has been amazing for me and what I the biggest thing I can get from Duet is that it allowed me to be a creative. It allowed me to release a passion for dance that I I did not even know I had. For me growing up and yes, I I love to dance and I was doing it before I do that, but for me that was a hobby. That was just something to do to kill time. Mm -hmm. Uh just something that felt good doing. It's not until I joined do that that I I was able to surround myself with so many other like-minded individuals who weren't doing this to be popular. They weren't doing it to make money. They weren't doing it because they had to. They were all we were all doing it because we love dance so much. You're lucky if you're able to find that. You're saying that like just now compared to then or just in general? Just in general, just in general. Like it, there's so many things to be passionate about, but I have so many friends who were stuck in whether they're doing jobs they hate, mm. they're not doing what they're passionate about. I have friends who just don't know what they're passionate about. So they just go through life just doing whatever. Um, and that doesn't matter if you're a dancer, that doesn't matter if you're a teacher, that doesn't matter if you're a construction worker, like they're not able, whether it be because of finances, whether it be because of, of kids, mm. um, et cetera, they're not, a, they're not able to explore it and go deep into it. Whereas do that gave me that opportunity. Mm. I am a different, I don't want to say I'm a different person, but it kind of is like that. Um, being on stage allows me to give off a certain energy, which I don't necessarily give off day to day. Mm. Like day to day, I'm a real chill person. I'm real um, low key. I'm chill. I, I'm a happy person. I love to laugh. I'm um, a feel good person. But being on stage allowed me to explore and to share different facets of myself. Mm. Like the more assertive side of me the more aggressive side of me, the, the sexier, the more chill, the more suave side of me, like music, dance, and, and doing it through do that allowed me to explore all these different sides and allowed me to share them with people. Mm -hmm. So when I think about do that, I think about it as family and that family really helped me dwell and push and dig into what was passionate in me and help me push it and explore it mm. to the masses, That's to great. the masses. Mm. Were there any uh, hardships that you experienced growing up? I asked that same question with Mark Samuels, like <laughs> the yeah. beginning of, uh, back in episode one. So if yeah. you haven't listened to that, you've got to listen. <laughs> Go back, Mark's my brother. Go back and listen to episode one. Um, I knock on, knock on wood. Um, I'm pretty much thankful that I haven't had any real hardships. I come from a middle-class family um, who's always been about work, 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 work. Um, they're not going to relax. We're going to work. My mother worked. My father worked. Um, they worked two, three jobs that they needed to take care of myself and my brother and my sister. Um, and growing up, that's what I had. That's what I looked up to. So for myself, I've always been one who needed to work. Like I've always had a side hustle or a side job or something so i'm not i've never really had to be that struggling dancer and i never i never wanted to be that struggling dancer um i don't believe that you have to if you're not struggling for your for your dream or for your passion that that doesn't mean you don't want it mm -hmm. like i feel you can do both so i've always been like be realistic with yourself you know you want money you know you want certain things Make sure you can do that and still pursue your dreams and your passion. So in the sense of when it comes to money, um, I've never had that struggle. Um, when it comes to to my body as well, I've never had that struggle. Thank, again, knock on wood. Um, I've been 
I don't remember it. I've never had an in like knock on wood again. <laughs> I've never had any injuries. I never I've never broken anything. I've never I've my knees are still good, my hips are good. Um I'm good. You know <laughs> what I mean? So in that sense I never had to struggle with that. Um I have I've I do have some friends who have had to struggle with like um self esteem issues or like or like just issues like mental illness, those type of struggles. Mm -hmm. When I get a question like that, like I haven't had to struggle. Mm -hmm. And again, I can only thank God for that, <laughs> to be honest. Now, there must have been a plethora of m moments that <laughs> Sheesh. Sheesh. you'll have to remember. But if we can... I mean, I'm not going to ask you to say what your most memorable one is yeah. because there's obviously a, a lot. There's but a lot. There if, we, if you were to maybe like, I don't know, scale it down to your top three, what would they yeah. be? And I thought about that's That's a hard question. Um, thank you. Especially when nowadays <laughs> uh, the lifespan for dancers is like six months. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I don't mean to laugh. Um, but I just mean it's sad to say for a lot of dancers that's what it is these days. Um, versus, again, I've been doing this since, I'll say it again, 1998. Um, there's been so many good times. There's been a, one or two bad times here and there, but honestly, there's been so many good times, so many memories. Um, uh, my first, like, uh, going to Europe to tour for the first time with Sean Desmond. That was cool. Uh, doing my first um, my first arena tour uh, in the states with with uh, M M M T R L um, with Eve. Um, what else? There's so many. Um, I've had a bunch of a bunch of uh, my first award show. Uh, yes. On the Canadian side, doing like the Juno Awards, or I think it was either um, it might have been Nathan Phillips Square for New Year's Eve or something like that. In the states, it was doing the People's Choice Awards or doing no, it was BET Awards. I'm sorry, <laughs> that was the first. Um, so many amazing things. Oh, going to going to do the Jay Z video in Nice, France. Mm. It, was a, it was on a private island. It was like things like that. It's been so many different things, but I will say this. I will say this. I guess when I think about it, this has to be one of one of the most um, inspiring, the most just the one of my favorite memories um, had to be this because I, I feel like it was like the cliche dance dancer's dream or the thing the dancer does where you, you leave the next day, you get on the Greyhound bus and you go to New York and you audition and and you land a big gig. Mm. And that's what happened for me. I, it would have to be, one of my greatest memories would have to be uh, landing Missy Elliott. Mm. And again, it was like taking a leap of faith. Um, I got a call like the, the day before that I was invited to a closed audition for Missy Elliott. And then I had to make the choice because it was really last minute. Do I like even try to go? What, what am I doing? Um, I probably had so many things going on in the city, but I was like, do I make the choice to just go? And then how am I going to get to New York? And then I was like, do I just jump on the Greyhound bus? Um, and I just like, you know what? Sometimes you just got to do it. And I just jumped on that Greyhound bus. Um, I got to New York the next morning. Uh, I met with some friends. I mean, Mark was there. Um, another friend of mine, Greg, was there. Just kind of just prepped myself for the audition anyway you know dance is the only way you can uh just go over what you know just mentally get in the game um it's a private audition it's a small audition uh which helped which helped sometimes when you have those massive auditions it could be a, li a little bit too much but it's a small private audition um i went in there at the time it was Cess and olisa big ups to Cess and olisa they were doing Missy's uh, choreography. They brought us in. They showed us the choreo. It was to uh, Get Your Freak On mm. by Missy. So back in the day, uh, they showed us the choreography. 
Um, you know, he didn't have a lot of time. And I don't know if you've seen their choreography before, but it's intricate, it's fast, it's hard. Um, so it was, you had to get that out of the way. But learned the choreography. Um, and then did it for them a few times. And for me, I remember thinking, okay, that's it. They're just going to decide who they want. And they're only looking for one. They only look for one guy. Oh, no. <laughs> so I think it wasn't even a big audition. I think it was like maybe six, six to eight of us. And they're only looking for one guy because they had their other dancers. So I'm like, okay, well, that's it. Whatever happens, happens. And then like Missy walks, <laughs> Missy Elliott walks in. And then that already is another like, <laughs> <laughs> Missy walks in and you want to like, at this point, Missy's like one of my faves. So I got to remember where I am. I can't look too thirsty. I can't look, I can't look like a fan. <laughs> Um, I got to calm down. Plus, I got to think, remember the choreo? Missy came in and she's, she, I didn't even remember her saying much. She just came in and she just sat in front and just watched. <laughs> and then we just did it a few times. I remember doing it, doing it. Um, and then that was it. And then we left. They were like, okay, please go out. So we're on the hallway. We're just waiting around. Not even thinking that we're going to know that day. Yeah. But we're just waiting in the hallway. And I just remember... They're coming out and they were like, <laughs> it was like, oh. and they're like, well, thank you all for coming out. Um, and just basically, Missy has decided to choose you. <laughs> I, was like, I remember myself, I was like, what? I was like, what? And I was like, yeah, Missy decided to choose you. And then that was, a, that was just like the rest of the day. I was on like cloud 200, not even <laughs> cloud nine. I was on cloud 200. Um, that was really dope. That had to be one of uh, my biggest memorable moment. Mm -hmm. um, and then even after that, even like going through the process of rehearsals and stuff, it's also memorable because that was the most I I've ever been stressed. Yeah, that like the pressure, it was so much pressure, so much stress. Um, the fact that, again, Cessna Lisa's Koyo is so, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. And there was little time and we were about to go to, I think we were about to go to London. Yeah, we were about to go over to London, Europe. And we had little time to get the show together. And it was like, Missy's in there and you got to go, go, go. And I was a little bit behind the other dancers who already knew some of the choreo. Yeah. They had, like they had done the video, for instance. I hadn't, done, I hadn't done the video. So I had to catch up and then I'm the new one. I also have to catch up and they all know and they all know each other. So like all of that was just like, like coming down on me. Um, and a lot of times those moments, those pressure moments are the ones that make you great. Those pressure moments are the ones that where you gain the most experience. And those pressure moments are the moments where you learn the most about yourself. Mm. And experience is something you can't teach. And that experience taught me a lot. Memorable. <laughs> I briefly, uh, you know, talked about this with uh, Mark in his episode. But because yeah. you grew up in a world where social media wasn't, yeah. Yeah. wasn't prominent, um, you had to kind of, uh, I guess, use other methods to kind of get, get your name out there. What were some of those things? I had to make sure I could get my name out there. I, myself, it was for me, especially back then, now you have the outlet of YouTube and you have TikTok and you have this and you have that. You have so many outlets mm -hmm. or different ways for you to, to, to show off your skills or show off your creativity or express your, your feelings, whatever. Back then we didn't have that. Like, like for instance, we do that. You'll find a lot of, you'll find some shows on, on YouTube if you're lucky, but there's so, there's so much stuff we did which which people will never never see um yes we have a lot of it documented but just the vast and the majority like you're so used to being able to go to google or go to youtube and see this and search that yeah a lot of the stuff we did you won't be able to do that and because uh, a lot of it is about being there at the moment being there in the experience so back then we didn't have Again, we didn't have YouTube. We didn't have those things to, to showcase us. We had to be our best showcasers. And when I say that, I mean, I had to make sure I left everything on that stage. Mm -hmm. 
that was how I was able to showcase myself. Um, it's about leaving that impression. I always wanted to make sure that whenever I went on stage, I left an impression on people. It's, 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 that's what people remember. And that's what people feel. Um, if you can, if you can get someone to remember you, I found they remember you all the time. That was my best selling point. Like I'll, I'll say this. I'm, I'm always honest. Was I the most technical dancer? No. Were there other dancers? Like for instance, Mark, I'll say for instance, like Mark, he's technical. Like Mark is <laughs> like he'll and clean and clean. Um, I mean, I'm not far from it, but I'm definitely not as technical as Mark or some of the other dancers I was dancing with. However, though, uh, my thing was performance and my thing was energy and attitude and flav. And for me, it was like, I may not be the best dancer on the stage, but you're going to remember me. Mm. And that was my, I guess, my motto. That's how I felt when I went on stage. I was like, you will look at me. I was like, I don't care what I have to do, but you will look at me. You will watch me dance and you will enjoy watching me dance. When I did videos, and again, we had a lot more videos back then, but whenever I did videos, I was always thinking about what's something I can do. So when I have that moment, it's a matter of, okay, I got that little camera shot. I always made them the best of certain things. Ooh, I got a camera shot there. Boom, they're going to get a look. Ooh, I got a camera shot there. They're going to get, uh, I don't know, they're going to get a groove right there, which they won't forget. Like, I always made sure that when you watched me or when I had the opportunity, um, I really tried to make sure that I did something that left an impression. Because I found that when I kept doing that, when people would, like, ask for do that or they would talk about a performance they saw, they'd be like, and that guy, that guy did that thing, or that guy did da-da-da. And you see how that guy gave that look in the music video? Um, and then that just made people aware of me. Mm. And then what happened was, at that time, it was great because, especially when you have a crew and, you're, and, and the person at the helm is doing a lot of choreography jobs, it's again who you know, and it's again you start seeing the same people. Mm -hmm. So what would happen is I would be working with these video directors. I'd be working with a lot of the the um, promoters for different things, and I would make sure I left that impression on them so that they would remember me for the next thing they're doing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times it's it at, back then it was about connections. It's still about connections now, but it was more about connecting. Who do you know? And, and, and making sure that they know you, whether they know your name or not, they, they remember you. Yeah. Um, as well as it's just a matter of professionalism. Like, for instance, another thing is being professional. Like, I, was always, I always made sure that I had good energy. Like, you want to be surrounded with people, not necessarily people you like, but at least people you can work with or energy, which is good. Um, and I always try to make sure that I gave off that, that positive energy, that feel good energy. Um, cause again, especially when you don't have the outlets, it's like, that's how you have to make people remember you. Like you have to make people remember you and then they'll look out for you when it comes to future work. Mm. Um, and that's what we had to do a lot back then. Pretty much that's it. Like it wasn't, it wasn't even like. I got to promote myself and I got to make up flyers and I got to hand, like it wasn't handing shit out. Like it was just a matter of do quality on that stage and that'll speak for you mm. and that'll spread. It's a lot, man. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but it, it, it is. No, it but is. it's great. Um, okay. So next I want to talk about standards. Yes. Standards. Now, obviously today in social media being around, um, a lot of talk about high standards uh, is essentially what we deserve. Yep. But yet you still see, you know, dancers still accepting jobs or yep. gigs for little to no pay. Um, would you say that was an issue during your upbringing as a dancer? I mean, you had talked earlier about uh, the abundance of opportunities, whether yep. it be, you know, stage, live, tour, music videos, all that type of stuff. Yep. Um, I think today it's a bit different. We are slowly starting to see an abundance of film and TV stuff. Exactly. And um, but 
again, back to the original question, would you say that keeping a high standard was, was uh, an issue during your upbringing as a dancer? Again, I always say like questions like that, they're loaded questions. It, it's, it's a hard question to, to answer. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like, because this question is, it always comes up. It always comes up. So when you talk to dancers, choreographers, boom, 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 it always comes up. Um, and I feel like it's come up for years. Mm. Like we've continued to talk about this for years. Um, growing up, and again, as a new dancer, it's always a matter of you want to show yourself. You want to be out there. You want to be seen. Um, and especially when you're starting out, it's all about you just love it. You just love it. Hey, I don't need money. I love it. I love doing it. This is the best. Why am I going to pay? I get to do a video with this artist. I get to dance in front of this thousand, this many thousand people. Who cares about money? And just like a lot of new dancers, that was me until I started realizing that, yes, I get to do what I love. And yes, um, it's a privilege um, just to be able to share my passion with others and just to dance. However, though, it is a business and this business is making money off of me. Obviously, you don't want to look at it that way, but it, ultimately, I was always real with myself. It is a business. They're making money. I'm making that artist look great. I'm making that artist show look great. And that artist is getting money. So why don't I deserve to get money as well? If you want to put it in monetary, mm. if you want to put it like that. At some point, you have to wake up. At some point. So I was just saying, so at some point, you have to realize that I'm doing something I love, but you're making money off of me. And at some point, if you, if you continue like that, they're in a business. Ultimately, they're looking out for themselves. They're not going to worry about if you have to pay this, if you have to pay that, if you're missing out on family obligations to come to rehearsal, if you're missing out on, on quality time, if you're missing out on uh, work, if you're missing out on this. They just care that you're there and that you're making their show great. So at some point, you really have to think to yourself, I'm part of the machine. I'm making money for the artists and the artist's label, et cetera. At some point, I deserve to make money as well. Like dancers, we really do make the show. And I think at some point that just clicked in for me. But it's good. Also, it's good when you have a circle who understands that. Because sometimes when we're in it, we don't. We, you're not going to see that. But I was fortunate to have a circle around me of like-minded individuals who were working just as hard as me. Some were having more struggles than I was. And they were like, no, you have to realize that you're, you're worth more than that. Why should they just exploit you for your skill for free or little pay? And I won't even talk about what is to be considered little pay. You're getting older, you have commitments, you have bills, you have to stand up for yourself and you have to be like, I deserve to get paid this. That's why it's great to like really talk to maybe some of your OGs who have the experience, who've been doing it for a while. I was able to talk to people like that and I was able to see that, no, I deserve this. And if I don't deserve this monetary amount, there has to be other reasons for me to, to accept the job or accept the gig. Mm. I'm not gonna say it's easy. It's never easy. Even to me at this point, like, don't get me wrong, I'm still asked to do gigs and, and work on different gigs. But I've turned a lot of gigs down or if I'm requested to select dancers for gigs, when I find out what the rate is, I'm like, well, sorry, I don't have dancers who will work for this. Um, if you want to try someone else, go ahead. Um, and don't get me wrong, a lot of times you will get those labels, you will get those management people who are like, well, this person will do it for peanuts. Let me go with them. And then you got to be like, okay, go with them. I now have years behind me where I can do that, where I can turn it down and either be okay with not getting the gig or know that when I turn it down, they will come correct with something else. Mm. Um, obviously you can't, obviously the more experience you have behind you, you'll be able to understand and see that you can do that because there's always going to be a dancer dancing for peanuts. There is. I mean, again, for a lot of the new dancers coming up, 
um, you got to look at the worth a little bit different. Like pay can come monetary, pay can come through experience of the gig, pay can come through um, exposure. If you're a dancer in the industry for a long time, you have to get past that, those exposure talks. Yeah. Like you really do. Like I, I, I know so many dancers who are still, who've been dancing for a while and they're to still talking about, well, this is great exposure. Like be real. Obviously if it's a, a lot of us have different artists we're passionate about. So I understand if like an artist is doing a gig and, and it's not paying what you want, but you love this artist or, or you, or this artist like doing this will really kind of take you into showcase you in another, in another uh, type of view. I get it. And sometimes I'm, I'm not against that. I understand. But I just feel like you have to make sure you understand why you're accepting the gig. I, I can't like, don't get me wrong. I can't I can't chastise someone for doing a non paying gig. Like if you feel it, it really is something for you and you're getting something out of it, then who am I to say don't do it? But just know what you're doing and make sure you're OK with it. That's what I say to dancers who like do dance for peanuts or dancers who who do gigs for exposure. Just know that that's why you're doing it. At the amount of experience I have, I was I just knew that I was doing a disservice to other dancers, a disservice to our industry by accepting the job for peanuts. Yeah, nobody wants peanuts anymore. Mm. You can't pay bills with peanuts. You can't enjoy life with peanuts. Like, don't eat so much peanuts. This came from one of the older uh, members in our community. <clears throat> but what does life look like after an incredible uh, career as a dancer? Life looks good. What's that Drake and that Drake and Future song? Life is good. Um, <laughs> it's 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 a change. I always tell I always tell a bunch of friends of mine. Um, it's definitely a new routine. Uh, you have to get used to. Uh, again, I, I've done a lot. And I, as a dancer, I always say I, I still want to do so much more. But when I think about it, when I have to, when I do interviews like this, when I have to uh, talk to um, talk to different students, talk to different, um, just like give my resume, for instance, or my bio for all of the different things I do. And I see the amount of work um, and the amount of quality work. I've been able to do. When I think back to all the experiences I have as a dancer, I've been able to travel across the world. Um, I've been able to to dance in front of thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Um, I've been able to to share my gift on 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 film, on television, live shows. Um, I've partied, I've toured, I've done, I've done the whole, the whole, every, the good and bad, of the touring, I've done it all. Um, I've seen some great things. I've experienced some great things. Um, but then for me, I just, I think that's where humility and being humble really has to kick in. Um, especially when it, when you begin to grow past your career as a dancer. Um, I've always, for myself, I've always been realistic. That's the word I'll use. Even when I started, I was always realistic with what I wanted in the industry, um, where I want to take it. Um, for me, education was always, always, always in the, um, not in the forefront, but always there, always in the background. I always knew the importance of education for myself. And I always knew that I could always, I can only dance for so long. Mm. You can only, honestly, you can only dance for so long. Um, so I knew for me, yeah, I knew when I first, start, even when I first started, I knew for me is that I needed to make sure that I had something to fall back on. And then for me, where a lot of dancers are, find themselves in this situation, I know I didn't want to be a choreographer. For a lot of dancers, the next step is, okay, become a choreographer. Um, but for me, I knew that 
I just wanted to dance and I just wanted to be a dancer. Yes, I can instruct. Yes, I, I do do choreography. Um, but I have, again, there's so many people who call themselves choreographers, um, but I, I don't take that lightly. People say not everyone can teach. Like there's a lot of great dancers, but not all of them can teach. There's a lot of great dancers, but not all of them can choreograph. Be a choreographer. You need to see, there's so many different things you need to see. You need to see the dancers and you need to see like, like the whole stage and how everything works together and how, and there's a story that's being told. And you have to be a storyteller to be a choreographer. You have to be able to be able to put all the different parts and pieces together. Um, or it just doesn't make, or it's just steps. Mm. It's not, and that's my main thing. It's just steps if you don't do that. And yes, I can do things here and there. I can give choreo. I can create little pictures. But I just knew that I don't necessarily want to be a choreographer. So I was always like, I need to make sure I have something to fall back on. Um, with that being said, I've I've lived a uh, I've lived a fortunate uh, life, and I've and I've done some great things. But I always knew that there is something after dance. And don't get me wrong, if you're not careful, you can get addicted to the fame. You can get addicted to the accolades. You can get addicted to the the life, the the traveling, meeting different people every time, the party scene, the social scene, which don't get me wrong, at different times in my life were all like really good and, I, and all I wanted. But I just knew from when I started that there will be a time where after dance, there's life. And make sure that you are ready for it and make sure you're realistic as to when that time should begin. Perfect segue into the next question because uh, you had transitioned into education. Yes. What are your philosophies as an educator or a teacher? Funny enough, dancing is what brought me to education. I was doing a lot of teaching um, and then I just so happened to start teaching in schools. So a lot of different teachers would bring me into their schools to, uh, to teach dance because dance is in the curriculum. Yeah. Um, and they were scared. They didn't know what to do. So it's like, okay, let's find someone. So I found a lot of, I got into a lot of schools that way. Um, and then just constantly after, after the sessions were done, I constantly had teachers telling me, wow, you engage the kids so well. Like they just have a like, they take a liking to you. Um, I don't know. It's just about your energy. It's just really engaging, mm. engaging. I kept hearing engaging, engaging. Um, for me, it was just, okay, thanks. I was like, okay, whatever. Kids have issues staying engaged and staying focused. Um, and they just kept saying that you really did engage them. Even the kids who didn't want to dance, weren't even thinking about dance, you really were engaging mm. and you found ways to keep them involved and interested. One of my main philosophies, especially when I teach, is that whatever I do, you want to keep it engaging. Um, whether, that, whether that means using social media, like, for instance, I have an assignment where I'm going to use TikTok. Um, just knowing your kids and being able to give them opportunities to use social media or technology because they're using it anyway. They're using it all the time, whether you like it or not. So for me, it's about finding ways to incorporate that into my classes mm. um, in the means of keeping them engaged. Nice. Yeah. Um, what do you think the biggest challenge is for students now, today? Um, again, and, I, and I, go, I teach at an art school. So I'll even say it's a little bit, a little bit different in the sense that these are all kids who are, for the most part, they're all creatives. They're all creatives. And if you're creative, you know how creatives can be. So everything is very, there's like, everything is, per, is like type A personalities. Everything is like on 10. Everything is on 10 for them. And I just find that, especially these days, uh, there's lots of issues when it comes to social media. Uh, that 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 technology is such an influence in our students' lives um, to the point where they can't 
and it's for adults as well, for me sometimes as well. But it's to the point where they can't eat, breathe, sleep without having a device in their hand, mm. without being able to check in on the TikTok or check in on their friends on Instagram or, or connect on Facebook. Like there's so there's such there's such a pull to social media that these kids have that unless we find ways, I think unless we find ways to really try to use it to our advantage um, and help engage them, uh, they're not listening. Also, another big thing I find, and working in a middle school, I was a little bit shocked, uh, but I just found that when it comes to um, our mental health and mindfulness, that's a huge issue. Um, a lot of our kids right now, they they have issues. I see it every day. I see it every day. I I hear stories, and it's really big right now. But I'm seeing it so much these days. I don't, I don't know what to, who am I to say why that is? And if it's related to, to me, social media, I don't know. But so many of our kids are dealing with mental issues. And we have to continue to find ways to keep the lines of communication open. Um, not put stuff like that under the rug. Uh, don't make those type of issues taboo anymore. Because our kids are really going through it. Mm. Really going through it. Last one on education. How do you motivate your students to learn? Again, at the moment, like I do, I do a lot of dance. I do a lot of phys ed, but I also teach all the other subjects. Um, and obviously, it's depending, it's, it depends on, this, on the student's interest. Um, I have students who um, are completely engaged when we do dance. And then, especially like last year, I was teaching math as well. And then when we did math, it would just shut off. And it was hard to motivate them. I also have students who aren't a fan of dance right now. They're at the art school for many other things. Dance isn't, they're, they just don't like to dance. But I still have to find ways to motivate them to dance. Mm. For me, what works is you have to look at it up from their point of view. You really have to try to know your students. It can be hard, especially when we have like 30 in a class to like one teacher. But I always try to find ways to know my students. Um, and then I try to use that and incorporate maybe things they like or the, what the majority like into lessons. Mm. Um, at least at that point, you can get as many as possible engaged and motivated. Um, students won't be motivated. People won't be motivated. Adults won't be motivated to do things they don't want to do, period. So if you can find things they like, they may, they may, not, like, they may not want to do something, but if you can find th portions or things in it that they like, which will help them at least attempt. Mm -hmm. And then you can push the motivation after. You just at least, you just have to get kids to at least attempt to do things. Um, and then you realize that they either find that they actually don't mind and they like it, or you find that with a little bit more push after they've at least started to attempt it, they're, they're motivated to at least finish it through. Mm. Now I close off um, every episode, I ask the same question to all my guests, but if you could give one challenge to dancers this year, what would it be? Oh, that's easy. And I feel like I am a broken record when I, when I say this. I think if you've been to one of my classes or my workshop or whatever, you've heard me say this because I've been saying it for years now. Uh, but it's so true. Be a performer. I say this all the time. Be a performer. With social media, we see that there are millions of dancers million of great technical dancers, but there's not millions of performers. Mm. Um, the difference is that a dancer just does steps. Dance is more than steps. And I feel that, especially these days, a lot of us are just getting stuck into the mechanics of it, the, technic the technical side of it. Um, you're just doing steps. Um, there's not enough performers. Performers, when you perform, you're able to, to communicate the message with the step. When I say communicate through your facial, through your presence, through your energy, um, especially my day, that's what it was about. It was about the energy, the, the, the attitude, um, the flave. Um, whereas now it's a little bit more on the technical side. 
I just see, always see a lot of steps. There's nothing memorable. There's nothing exciting. There's nothing new or unique. It's just steps. It's more of the same steps. When you perform it, you connect the mood of the song, the feel of the song to your steps. It's not just a five, six, seven, eight. Um, and I think that's what is lacking. And I think that's what we need to get back to. Mm. It's dancing performing, doing more than steps. Again, it's more than steps. Um, once we can get to that, um, I think you'll see a lot more newness on the stage. You'll see a lot more people dancing from the heart. We just need more of that. And I think once more of that happens, um, more dancing from the heart will happen. More, more, more interesting, more creativeness, more uniqueness my uniqueness will just will just happen on that on those stages mm. yeah yeah touch always a pleasure man thank you thank you i have to say this was a great experience though roy um i do appreciate what you're doing for our our city right now because and he didn't pay me say this um <laughs> but no this is really needed um Again, I do go around. I, trust me, I do have a lot of new kids who do know of me or have heard of me ask me, like, it's different now. Why is it different now? Da, da, da. Um, yeah, I can tell them, but I think a lot more people need to hear this. And I feel like you're giving um, avenue to that. Like, you're allowing more people who, who haven't heard from me, who don't even know me, maybe. Is, hey. But now they're getting to experience people like myself, like Mark, um, even the new ones. Um, and, and being able to like hear knowledge and knowledge is power <laughs> period. Thanks man. Yeah. Um, how can people continue this conversation with you or how can they find you on social? Find me on social. I'm on Instagram at just touch J U S T U C H, uh, Facebook as well. It's one of those things where you just got to, if you want to know, you'll find ways to know. I'm not all over social media. I didn't grow up in the age of social media. I don't have a YouTube page. I don't have, I don't even have a website. If you need to know, there's ways. Contact me, hit me up. I still do workshops. I still teach around the city. I still do my movement coaching. I still work on different TV, film sets. But the thing is, you may not know, but the only way you're gonna know is if you search for it. Like, yes, you have all that power at your fingertips, but you have to use your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> you have to use your fingers straight up. Once again, this is another episode of the Unplugged Podcast. Just want to remind you guys about the relief fund that we have set up. Uh, touch yes. uh, graciously donated. So thank you oh, oh. very much for that. Pleasure. And uh, a reminder to stay safe. Wash your hands for 20 seconds. Practice social distancing. Have fun. And above all, stay creative. 100%. But until then, my name is Roy. I'm the host of the Unplugged Podcast. Yeah, and yeah, we yeah, will yeah, see yeah. you guys soon. Take care. Peace.